Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good, good whatever time zone you're in. Thank you very much for joining us for the fourth um, installment of our um, uh, webinar series that's trying to cover applications of EEG and for research and various applications. Today's topic uh, is uh, combining uh, EEG with remote eye tracking for research and neuromarketing. And uh, we're fortunate to have with us uh, guest speakers, um, Keith Jackson from iTech and Stefan Foley from TA Ergo. And in a little bit, they'll tell you about their technologies and how we bring all these together for the purposes of advancing your research. Uh, so we'll do a quick, um, quick uh, overview of what we're talking about, and then we'll jump into it. I'll, I'll do a quick introduction to our dry wearable EEG systems. And um, we will then jump into eye tracking, describe what we can do with eye tracking as well, and how we interface those and talk about how combining those can be helpful and then give one example in neuromarketing. Uh, we'll leave some time at the end for questions, but you're welcome to write in your questions in uh, the uh, Q&A box and we will try to address those at the end. And Cameron will uh, support us in uh, monitoring that. All right, so for those of you who don't know us, we are wearable sensing. We have been revolutionizing brain monitoring with our revolutionary uh, dry electrode technology, which has allowed us to take um, EEG monitoring from the lab to the real world. So briefly, uh, there are a number of um, brain monitoring technologies, which you might have been familiar with, fMRI, PET, and MEG are examples, and those are really stationary, really good the technologies, but you can't take them outside of their um, shielded environment. So in terms of ambulatory, um, AFNIR has recently emerged as a potential portable solution. Implanted electrodes are getting a lot of hype today uh, in terms of their future potential, but they're really not yet something that people are willing to walk out uh, of the uh, limited research environment they're in. So that leaves us with EEG as well, and that's the one we're going to talk about. So when we look at the various trade-offs between the um, different technologies, we can see that there are people typically look at spatial and temporal resolutions for these factors. But there's also, when you go to the real world, you need to consider ease of use, availability of technology, its robustness to motion artifacts, to environmental artifacts, its portability and cost effectiveness. And when we look at that, we see that EEG has a lot of pluses going for it. And in the next webinar, we'll talk about combining it with uh, NEARS um, to kind of get uh, the best of both worlds. What is EEG? EEG is the measure of the electrical activity of the brain as measures from the scalp. When enough neurons um, act together, fire together, you get local field potentials that spread through the brain, across the dura, across the skull, and get measure, can be measured on the skin typically using electrodes such as those that you see over here. Typically, you rub off the layer of dead cells on top of the skin, and you apply some gel with a needle to get some good low contact impedances, and then you can measure signals that look like what you see on the right. And here, I like this illustration because it shows you that just by looking at the morphology of these traces, you can see differences between cognitive states, differences between arouse and relax, where you see these alpha waves and the deeper spindles and delta waves and as you go to sleep. Typically, when we talk about analyzing EG, we look in the Fourier domain, we talk about power bands that are defined and given Greek names, and we'll be talking about those maybe a little bit later. For, the purpose, for our purposes, the problem with EEG was that you couldn't really take it outside of the lab. You needed to rub the skin. That was really an, an irritating. It wasn't something you could do over and over without really aggravating people. Um, it required use of gels, which was tolerable in the lab setting, but really wasn't going to be something that people would do in a real-world setting. Plus, there was a lot of motion artifacts, electrical artifacts. It really wasn't a portable system with all the cables and wires around it. So what we developed um, is a dry electrode technology, and you're going to see that being donned on the subject here on the bottom right, and I will describe what we did. Uh, so we developed a technology that required no skin abrasion, no gels or liquids. And we took a sensor technology that we had developed for that had very high sensitivity and very low noise. We, uh, those are combinations of different capacitive and resistive ultra high impedance amplifiers. We put those uh, the electronics together and, saw, and we added some pins 
so that those could go through the hair, and we developed uh, the first dry electrode. Um, it was very important to have good signal quality, so we were sponsored by military. We had funding from DARPA, Navy, NIH, uh, and the Air Force, and they all wanted to make sure that we had good signal quality. So we spent a lot of time validating the signal quality we could get. Here's some traces showing simultaneous recordings of conventional wet electrode EEG and dry electrode EEG simultaneously recorded, and you can see that the blue and red traces overlap very nicely, and you can see the um, traces um, are getting better than 90% correlation. So the next challenge was to reduce the motion and electrical artifacts, and so we did that by implementing our um, uh, amplifiers immediately behind the electrode, so this is known as an active electrode, and then we put those electrodes on a spring. That spring here is illustrated. What it's doing is it's shielding uh, the contact from movement. So if the headset was to move, you notice that the electro tip maintains contact with the scalp. So that spring is very important. And the other important aspect is this outer ring, which provides both a mechanical anchor point, but also a Faraday cage. So a Faraday cage is an electrical shield. So that means, and there's the backside of that Faraday cage. So that means that the only signal that would come in would be from the scalp. Everything would get amplified inside the Faraday cage, and all the other electromagnetic activity from the outside is shielded by the Faraday cage. So that allows us, allows us to get really low artifact, low noise recording. Once we had that, then the next job was um, making this usable. So we spent a lot of years uh, developing headsets that were easy to use, easy to put on, uh, that were comfortable to wear repeatedly and for a long period of time. And finally, uh, last but not least, we had to make these devices wireless. And so that uh, means putting uh, some Bluetooth to transmitters and the ability to store the data on board so that you could walk out into the real world and record data. What you're seeing the person do right now is this is the tool that we use to uh, work the electrode through the hair. And he is working the electrode through the subject's hair. And that is the last sensors that he's doing. And that, took, that process took about three minutes to don a 19 electrode headset on the subject. So what does this data look like from the subject? So here's that subject now getting up uh, and get the data from the subject. So we'll see some um, blinks. So this is a blink. This is the EEG signals. After we checked the impedances, we're all good. Uh, now we'll see a flutter of blinks in a little bit. So this each channel here is an electrode and with reference to the ear clips. So this was three uh, eye blinks. And in a second, the, the subject will close her eyes and show us the alpha activity that gets generated. Oh, no, those are jaw clenches. So this is the one, two, and three jaw clenches. So this is the EMG that is generated by her jaws tightening. And next, we'll see this is the eyes closure. And this particular sinusoidal wave, this is the alpha activity that gets generated by the default mode network in the brain when you close your eyes. Next, we are going to illustrate the shielding to uh, resistance to electrical artifacts. So what I'm going to do is I'm tapping my foot behind the subject. You can see these red lines. Those are measuring the common mode electrical artifacts on the body, and notice the black EEG lines are unaffected. So there's no filtering here. There's no artifacts removal. Now the subject is tapping her foot, and you can see very large artifacts are being generated. Uh, but again, only these two channels here picked up a little bit of artifact. All the other ones were really clean. Now we're going to remove the low-pass filter, so there's no filtering, and you see a lot of 60 hertz, and the subject is putting her foot on electrical cable, so we see a lot of 60 hertz signal picked up, but only on the red channel, nothing on the EEG channel. Again, there is now no filtering. Now um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to ask the subject to get up and walk around, and you're going to see on the red channel, you'll see her footsteps. Every movement she does will generate triboelectric discharges. You can see very large artifacts on the red channel but the EEG signals are very nice and clean. No artifacts being picked up on those. And next, she will move her arms around, and you'll see that, again, we are not... So many artifacts. Okay, so that was a demonstration of uh, what it took to get this technology out to the real world. So what I told you is that we developed a dry electrode technology that works through hair. 
gives us high signal quality, artifact resistance, and we've designed headsets that were fast to set up. You saw that set up in three minutes. You'll have to trust me today for it being comfortable, but then you're welcome to reach out to Cameron and uh, arrange for a demonstration or a trial to, get, to see for yourself how comfortable it is. You can get up and walk over these headsets, and we even have versions, most of our headsets now interface with virtual reality. So this is the hardware that we brought about. And next, real briefly, I'm going to tell you about one piece of software that's relevant for some of the conversations we'll be talking about today. And that's uh, what we call Q-States. It's our cognitive gauge. So Q-States will bring, extract features from the EEG data as well as EMG, ECG, OG, galvanic skin response, skin temperature, respiration, and FNIR data. And it has a machine learning algorithm that you have to train uh, either for an individual model or for normative models. It trains very quickly with very little data. It, uh, it does artifact uh, elimination such as blink artifact removal, EMG artifact removal. And then it gives you classification in real time. So here's an example of it running. What we're doing here is we're showing that we can classify mental workload. So this subject here is running uh, easy tasks. We've created two models. One is engagement, so he's engaged in the task, paying it, highly paying attention. And then the next two are his workload models. And you see that his workload models right now are low. This is a very easy task. He solves it in two and a half seconds. He's getting them right. And next, you'll see another easy one here, solves it pretty quickly. He's very highly attentive, and the workload is pretty low. Now you'll see the task will get pretty hard. Notice he lost a little bit of uh, attention here. A workload is just starting to rise. And he has to guess it, and he got it wrong. He wasn't paying attention. Now you notice the engagement is back up. His workload is much higher and you'll see that he's able to solve those. On the bottom line here, we're seeing, we're tracing that over time. So you can see the uh, traces um, showing the mental workload plotted on the y-axis and the x-axis is time. So we saw the three easy ones first had low mental workload, followed by the two difficult ones that had a high mental workload, followed by three easy ones that had very low workload, hard, hard, easy, 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 hard, hard. So you can see we can track very well with, uh, with these gate with these EEG based gauges, the mental workload of the subject. So we'll be talking about how we can use these types of cognitive gauges for other applications in a little bit. But for now, I'm going to uh, move us into um, uh, let Keith tell us about um, eye trackers and what they've been doing with eye trackers, and we'll talk about how we combine those together with EEG. Keith, thank you, Wally. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, thanks uh, for the invite. Excited to be here today to go over, uh, like Wally said, how eye tracking uh, combined with EEG can provide uh, greater outcomes for your research. <clears throat> A little bit about our company. <clears throat> uh, we are based in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we're a B2B enterprise. Uh, we have served well over 10,000 um, installs around the world. Um, we have a reseller network in about 35 countries. And I, we're, we're, um, I'm also based in Phoenix. Um, we have, um, we started 25 years ago because um, our founder, Robert Chappell, actually injured his arms from typing too much. And that's our biggest market is helping paralyzed people regain uh, independence through our uh, I, latest uh, technology and services, um, as you can see in the pictures. Um, individuals who are, you know, bedridden or paralyzed in, in a wheelchair can communicate and do everything all with their eyes, send emails, make phone calls. And the combination of eye gaze uh, with BCI is kind of a new trend uh, for improving the, the overall input um, and performance for these users as well. So that, that's really exciting uh, work there. And as a company, we're focused on medical applications from communication aids for disabled, working with hospitals for patients who are bed, uh, in bed and can't communicate. They can quickly communicate their wants and needs uh, through our device. And then on the research side, we're doing a lot uh, with cognitive and vision screening, uh, baselining, um, monitoring, and um, just to give you an overview of iTech. Um, 
we we focus our solutions on with, with an eye tracking on a chip uh, which gives you fixed hardware timestamp data it's an fpga chip um, that can run at uh, high frame rates and be adapted to multiple operating systems uh, we use the xilinx zinc chip there in our uh, ai 1.0 technology which is in our vt3 mini eye tracker that you see here uh, magnetically connects to a laptop uh, connect, uh, through a single usb connection and now we have our latest uh, integrated solution. Uh, we manufacture this, it's FDA registered, um, and it's a 14 inch Windows 10 tablet. Uh, the eye tracking technology is built, built into the bottom there with two infrared light sensors. And we use a dark pupil technique, and this is leveraging our AI 2.0 technology, which has actually machine learning and AI built into the chip. And it has an improved camera sensor, so you have a, a large head box size forward and back. And this can run uh, 40, 60, 120, 200, 250, or 500 hertz. Uh, so it can be adapted and configured that FPGA chip to run at the various frame rates. It is a sleek design, less than uh, uh, an inch thick, um, has an integrated uh, stand, uh, similar to like uh, the Surface tablet, but it is our own proprietary design. And why is our AI 2.0 uh, great? Um, again, it can be configured and tuned to a high, low and high frame rates, depending on your research needs. And that eight megapixel sensor gives a huge head box size and much uh, better signal to noise. So you get very uh, tight correlations. So you can analyze micro cicadic activity, fixation data, um, and then we also have a new user-driven calibration, which gives us about a 30% improvement in error reductions in the calibration. Um, and let me just show you a benchmarking tool we use called Quick Test um, that we use to measure our accuracy, our precision, our head motion tolerance, glasses performance. Um, we work a lot with uh, cerebral palsy, RETS, where there's a lot of involuntary movement, and we're able to reacquire the eye quickly and easily. In this video here, um, it just shows this particular benchmarking tool. So as I move my head forward and back, you can see the crosshairs on my eyes um, in green show that it's locked onto my eye. And then I'm going to go ahead and perform the user-driven calibration for you in just a sec. This, one, this is running at 40 frames per second. And we run hundreds of subjects through uh, to benchmark our algorithm so that we're always improving the technology so you'll see the targets you can look at in any order and then once they disappear it gives you an, a score and then we'll run hundreds of subjects through different tests this particular test shows a live uh, example of my gaze in relationship to a fixed point on the screen so you can see how quickly and accurate uh, the gaze uh, is in all areas of the screen and this is filtered, of course, but um, various software plugins that have tied in with our API can visualize the data uh, with, with no uh, filtering. Uh, so you can create areas of interest, um, you know, be able to identify time to first fixation, do your visualization of heat maps, uh, focus maps, uh, also tracking the, the mouse clicks and uh, synchronizing all those data streams into your EEG your heart rate, your skin temperature, all those um, into one software. So there's a, a variety of softwares that we support um, that have integrated with our API. There's a few of those acknowledged from Biopack, Cap Captive Neurolab, um, which we'll be discussing later. Um, and then uh, the iMotions and Mangle Vision um, are, are software options that you can choose um, when you do have one of our eye, eye tracking devices. We also have a software tool called Quick Capture, um, which is a very easy to use uh, tool for capturing the data to a CSV file, and then you can export that to your own, uh, your various programs that you wanna use, MATLAB or others uh, for visualization. And then we do have an API called Quick Link, um, where you can stream the data into your own program, uh, gathering the XY gaze data, the fixation, the cicadic activity, pupil size, 
And we also do have wrappers, uh, C++, C Sharp, MATLAB, and Python, to name a few. So I wanted to go over now just a few uh, medical applications and research applications that we've done over the years, and one of which is called the OCAT test. Uh, this is uh, an app that we licensed from Mayo Clinic, and it is a great solution for uh, baseline screening, um, the eye activity on, in a cognitive workload function. Um, it takes about 60 seconds to do. Uh, it's very fast and easy, and I'll show you how it works. Um, so the user um, just looks at a series of numbers and adds them in sequences of three. So I'll go ahead and pause it for just a second. So the number seven down there at the bottom is the um, beginning of a sequence, and you'll add that number to the next and then to the next. The last number of the sequence is red, meaning the next uh, that that's the end of the sequence and then so you'll start over and that's done 12 times so 36 points so you'll say 7 9 is 16 um, so I'll start over 9 5 is 6 15 and 23 um, and then you just keep going so as you're looking at that it's giving a cognitive workload function and you'll notice in the data Sorry about that. I, uh, my audio just cut out. Uh, so you'll notice in the data, it then gives you a baseline screen of your ocular performance, the diagonal, horizontal, and vertical saccades, and then a cognitive performance score uh, based on how quickly you identify the three numbers in those sequences, um, and then total fixation count and the, the pupil dynamics. Can everyone hear me okay? Your, your audio your is audio stopping, is stopping up. up. Okay. This is second. But Keith, perhaps uh, if you just can you go quickly through those because uh, we're, we're going to run out of time for Stefan. You muted throughout the meeting. The host would like to join with your microphone. You can press star six. Sorry about that. My uh, phone dropped for some reason. Uh, so this is a, an example for autism research. So this little, these little kids would sit in a um, um, little big wheel, and then our eye tracking device uh, was attached to a screen, and they would look at different um, uh, items on the screen, and they were looking to see if during the learning experience, if um, static versus interactive learning was uh, helpful for these kids with um, you know ASD um, and the, you can see from the stats here there was a, a direct correlation when there was an interactive or a sh showing of the demonstration of the learning exercise the engagement uh, went way up uh, which was great that was wor uh, work done out of uh, UCLA um, and uh, uh, University up in Seattle and then for shopper research um, you know, companies like Procter & Gamble, Kellogg's, and a, a lot of the major consumer packaged goods companies want to do findability studies on the shelf to see how quickly their product jumps out to the consumer. Uh, so again, another uh, great use case. Uh, in this particular example, they were wanting to identify frosted Cheerios, how quickly they could identify. And it did take quite a while, 9.4 seconds after fixating on uh, 27 points before actually finding the frosted Cheerios. So Apple Jacks, you know, with their bright green package always jumps out a lot more than just kind of your low tone blue frosted Cheerios. And then lastly, um, 
eye tracking, we've been doing a lot on the reading research to understand, um, you know, individuals who struggle with dyslexia or ADHD having focus and attention issues. Um, with eye tracking, we can directly follow uh, where they're look reading, uh, if they're going back and rereading the exercise, and uh, perhaps which words they're spending more time on. And so this was an example of in the immersive reader tool, which is a free reading app uh, that Microsoft puts out, is single line versus displaying all the lines at once more effective for, for the reader. Um, so that, that's a great, great example. And lastly, the um, improving training with eye tracking. We did a project several years ago with uh, a, a group called Design Interactive, which is um, contracted with the TSA to improve baggage screening. So as you go through this, as your bags go through the screening process, the TSA employee is looking to identify threats. So uh, they deployed several installations across the country. Uh, you can see the two screen eye trackers here, one on each screen. And because we're able to have our eye tracking on a chip technology, um, running the eye tracking, we can actually connect multiple eye trackers to a single uh, PC, which was great for this particular uh, commercial use case. Um, and just to give you an idea, here's a little video showing Screen Adapt, which is the app, and how it's being used uh, to improve baggage screener training to develop those visual skills, identify those threats. Um, so some, some great uh, progress has been made uh, to provide those accountability measures. Um, this could be, you know, in this example, TSA, but, um, you know, medical uh, training or other, you know, mission critical or highly paid professionals, uh, we can develop and improve their skills by giving that direct feedback with eye tracking. So that, that's uh, what I had for today. I'll go ahead and pass, pass it back. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Walid. Uh, let me just share quickly my screen with you. Stefan, hold on. I'm gonna there's, I'm gonna link up in a second to you. Okay. All good now. Um, no, I, I just want to show a few slides covering following up on what just Keith uh, was talking oh, about. Okay. okay, please go. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, everybody. Just kick me out. Okay, so I just want to follow up on uh, an experiment we did that's uh, similar in scope to uh, what Keith did, but we here we were adding EEG to the eye tracking, and again, the idea was to measure competence and compare the uh, brain activity and the uh, eye tracking activity of experts, uh, x-ray screeners that were recruited from uh, TSA compared to novices who had just completed uh, training simulation this was a collaboration between Eye Tracking Inc. and uh, Quasar and uh, SPI. So just to, you know, we collected the uh, EG data while they were performing an X-ray screening task, and we looked at cognitive gauges and the eye tracking, and just to show you a little bit of what the um, results looked like when we looked at their task performance, um, one of the novices was not doing as well as the other, as the experts. One of this, this, the second novice, actually this was a very small feasibility study, so very short, small number of subjects. But this uh, subject here performed quite well and by both um, metrics was indistinguishable from the experts in terms of response duration, correct answers, false answers, etc. cetera. Uh, however, when we looked at their cognitive workload, we could see that this novice was really, really uh, thinking very hard on this task compared to how much the experts were having to exert in terms of mental effort. So we could distinguish an expert from a novice by looking at their cognitive workload, even when they couldn't be distinguished by their performance. And this is just um, looking at um, if we calibrated to make sure that the performance on other tasks were all the same between novices and the experts. When we looked at the eye tracking, we could also get some useful insight by their gaze patterns. We could see, for example, novice one, scanning all over the screen and trying all sorts of tools to identify something. 
whereas the experts were kind of much more focused and, and concise and faster. And sometimes the uh, experts would spend a lot of time reviewing an object that the novices would miss completely. So it was a useful way of combining EEG and uh, eye tracking to get at the measure of expertise and to help train people uh, to do the task. As an applied example of this, outside of the training, we have a partner uh, called InnerEye, and they've been using our EEG headsets uh, currently in uh, pilot studies at airports to uh, improve the ability of uh, X-ray screeners to manage the load. So instead of having one security officer manning one X-ray, they can now have one security officer manning five X-rays by using combined human um, uh, EEG and artificial intelligence to help them make the decisions much, much faster and much more accurately. Um, so what's important to be able to do eye tracking EEG together is a number of ways to interface and synchronize the data. Uh, so Keith mentioned acknowledgement, vision, iMotion. Stefan will be telling you about Captive, Neuralab. Um, some cases you may need to have uh, really high synchronous um, synchronization. So in those cases, you might need to use some uh, triggers or um, the API to get the data together. Um, so there's a number of ways to get the data synchronized together. So Stefan is going to give you an example using um, Neuralab and specifically how to use it for neural marketing. Um, beyond that, I just want to highlight here the range of things that you can explore by combining eye tracking EEG, range from cognitive psychology to understanding behaviors and interactions, neuroergonomics, understanding what drives um, us and the user interfaces, what drives our engagement and our attention, um, trying to do neurohabilitation, sports science. Um, biomarkers, so uh, Keith showed examples of autism and concussion. Those can also be done via EEG. So combining uh, multimodality, the eye trackers with the EEG can help improve the uh, accuracy, the reliability of your biomarkers. And we gave some examples in education and enterprise. So the, the sky is the limit. We're, we're here trying to introduce you to some uh, ways of interfacing eye trackers with EEG to support your research, you're going to have a wide range of applications, and we're really encouraging you to find how you can leverage and benefit by combining these two modalities together to get something more than you could do with one alone. So, Stefan, now I will leave it to you to tell them of one great example of such combined application. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. Right, so, um, I'm going to show you now, keeping in alignment with timing, the um, the captive software, Captain Europe software, where you can uh, record, synchronize, uh, and um, manipulate and analyze all that you've seen and, and heard uh, until now. So uh, the this software is dedicated mainly to these uh, three applications, which we've been discussing. Uh, this morning or this afternoon, and there's a few other ones which are not in, in, in the topic of this uh, of this presentation. The the main principle, and this is basically the, the main slide to remember from my presentation of this software, is that it's everything in one place, uh, starting with eye tracking, whether distant, remote, or stationary, as it is called, or head-mounted with the so-called glasses system. Uh, it does uh, allow the capability to record um, skin conductivity uh, through a, a wireless uh, GSR sensor, which estimates arousal. And I will elaborate a little bit more on this later. Uh, it, of course, allows to record uh, EEG data. And, uh, and optionally, there is a face coding module uh, to qualify uh, facial expressions. And all this goes into one single place, which is the, the Captive Neural Lab software, where anything from, well, whatever a PC can display uh, can be analyzed and displayed in any kind of combinations and, and permutations. Uh, so uh, that after this, uh, you have, and this is the, the strength of this, uh, of this solution, you just not only have statistics and, and tables, which you get, of course, but very um, 
aggregated data about uh, eye tracking and arousal and EEG and, and so on. And you will see this in a, in a short example that we'll show uh, in, a few, in a few moments. So why, <laughs> there's many reasons to choose this solution, but I just don't have the time to, to elaborate on all of them. So uh, I, I encourage you to, to play back the, the recording of this webinar, which you will have access to uh, a bit later so that you can, you can dig into this further. Uh, there's two packages available. So one for screen kit, as the name says, which enables to track across a, a display. So the software standalone is available, of course, but most customers go for the, the kit which does contain the um, emotional intensity measurement sensor, uh, which is the, uh, the GSR sensor for, for the so-called arousal again. And there's a kit which contains the same plus uh, the capability to be ambulatory with uh, eye tracking glasses uh, anywhere in the field, shopper studies or whatever, as you've seen before. Uh, and in this case, there's a, there's a portable recorder that comes with it. Uh, we are obviously natively compatible with the uh, iTech eye trackers, whether it is the um, VT3 uh, mini series and now the, the ION tablet that Keith show, um, presented earlier. And we are also compatible with a few other uh, solutions out there. And when it comes to um, portability, uh, these are the two uh, wearable eye trackers that uh, the software is natively compatible with, with, with no need uh, for any other third-party software. Uh, in all these cases, the hardware only is sufficient and Captive Neural Lab uh, takes over for recording analysis and, and so on. And for both uh, those kits, um, we have elected two EEG systems. So the, the, the wearable sensing tech presented by Wallet, which we like very much with the dry electrode system and uh, the uh, ABM uh, solution, which is a wet electrode uh, device. And both do have uh, these clever cognitive metrics with this, um, either this open classification mechanism that um, Wallet presented with the Q states, while the, the ABM has a predefined set of cognitive modalities available. So uh, the very, very quickly, uh, a short example uh, about uh, a neuromarketing uh, study uh, related to um, perfume. So a group of participants were requested to look at a variety of um, perfume bottles uh, in, a, in a given chronology with um, all within the same time duration, five seconds each. And during this experiment, uh, a wearable sensing uh, GSI24 headset was used to measure both raw data and also engagement, which consists basically in paying attention to. So subjects were calibrated accordingly. There was uh, an iTech VT3 Mini as the eye tracker and uh, the, the, the GSR sensor, which is again natively supplied with, with the solution. So, uh, well, Captain Verolab has all the bells and whistles and, and, and capabilities of, a, of an advanced eye tracking analysis software, of course, which with the, with the heat maps uh, and all, all those results can be uh, um, calculated across the entire test population, one by one, or subgroups of these users. In this case, those who use perfume, those who hate perfume, whatever the segmentation belongs to, to the user, to the user, sorry. So uh, heat maps, of course, across the entire uh, media set or uh, regions of interest and so on. There's, of course, the, 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 gaze, play, the gaze trail playback with, with fixations and proportions duration. The, their, the fixations are also rendered across their, their chronology as they occur. There's an arousal gauge, uh, which links also the gaze position when uh, the arousal kicks in. Uh, this is how the EEG states uh, with the, the B-Alert system are rendered in the software, and we will see the DSI data in the, in the next slides. And uh, there was no facial uh, expression recording in this example, but I just wanted to, to show you how it looks like also in the, in the software. So if we look a little bit more about 
the, the results of this, uh, of this test. Uh, first, if we uh, look at the arousal, uh, we see that only four of the 17 bottle pictures um, trigger a significant arousal response, and here they are. So the way the way to read that scale is that typically, uh, for instance, for picture picture of number 12, during uh, the 60 seconds of the total time, 60 percent, sorry, of the total time when this uh, image was visible, displayed, uh, there is a very strong probability that uh, the um, response felt um, uh, an emotional reaction while looking at it. Whatever this emotion is, uh, needs to be qualified uh, differently because uh, there's no means to tell this now. It would be black magic, but uh, through uh, questionnaires, through face coding, or through uh, other means, which I don't have the time to, to elaborate upon here, then you can have a, a good feeling of what, what this is about. And, and this is the eye position. Uh, of uh, the, the participants when this uh, arousal uh, probability kicked in. And if we look at the EEG, uh, we see that the two, the two highest engagement reactions were uh, actually beyond, so we took only the one here which are above 80% for this example. Uh, this is when they were looking at these sort of neutral uh, uh, basic bottles. So was this surprise, perplexity, and so on? Then we can dig further into that, but uh, my time is up. Uh, so we can explore this one-to-one -one later if you wish. Feel free to reach out and uh, thanks for your attention. And Walid, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. And I'm just going to take uh, one more slide just to conclude. All right, so basically, thank you guys um, for uh, your sections. So just to summarize, we described to you guys uh, our system for uh, high signal fidelity dry electrode EEG and how we can get out into the real world and record uh, comfortably and practically with a quick setup and, and the tools to analyze the data with some cognitive states measures. And with uh, Stefan's uh, Captive Neural Lab illustrated how you can get some summary reports. Showed you guys how we can combine some of these to get some exciting um, additional information by getting eye tracking combined with the EEG data. And Keith uh, illustrated a number of additional applications that eye tracking can do. And so what we're hoping to do here is by, by showing you these examples and these um, uh, various applications, just really engage your imagination and for your own research and to explore how you can combine eye tracking with EEG to improve the richness of your data to provide additional supportive um, information uh, for your uh, research. So with that, I want to conclude and um, open the floor to questions. Thank you, thanks Stefan and uh, Keith for their time and their presentation. I'll let you guys know that our uh, March um, webinar will be on EEG and FNIR, and uh, open the floor to any questions. At the moment, it doesn't look like we've got any questions that have come in so far. We can uh, give it a couple minutes. Um, alternatively, if anyone has any questions, they're welcome to send them in. Um, to our email, you can email us at info at wearable sensing or uh, um, actually we got one question that come in. Um, two questions. Is there a single software solution for both EEG and visual tracking? So there isn't yes. a single software solution. Oh, no, go, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> no, please do. You're the boss here. Uh, no, no, I, I was going to say there isn't a single solution. There are many solutions out there. Um, so Stefan presented Captive Neural Lab as a solution that uh, allows you to do both. And uh, there's also a Captive uh, uh, 7000, which is a research platform that allows you to integrate those and, and collect the data along with a number of other uh, modalities that we had covered in previous webinars, uh, from cardiac sensing to uh, respiration to motion tracking. All those are really nicely synchronized and integrated into the Captive suite. 
which allows you to also see all the data in one place and analyze and do some basic analysis and then export it all synchronized. You can also synchronize with lab streaming layer. Um, you can also synchronize with the iMotion software. And some of those don't necessarily uh, support all the EG devices that are out there. Some of them don't support all the eye trackers that are out there. Um, Captive does support our, both our systems. Um, and then we're working on getting a live streaming layer to also interface with uh, the eye tracking systems. Awesome, thanks. Uh, next question is, do the glasses interfere with the EEG? So uh, I can answer that. Um, not the glasses that we have tested so far. So we've worked with, we've had people working with the Toby glasses. We last week, uh, last month, we showed a demonstration using the Pupil Labs uh, glasses worn at the same time with the EEG for data collection while the subject was driving in the car. So the two systems operate independently. The shielding on our electrode uh, protects us from electronic interference from other devices that could be worn on the body. Uh, so uh, in that regard, they don't interfere. And the EEG is outside of the range of view of the uh, eye trackers, so we don't interfere with the eye trackers operation either. Awesome, thanks for that. Uh, that looks like all the questions that we have right now. Um, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to send them in to Info Wearable Sensing, or you guys can contact TEA Ergo um, or iTech as well. And, and with that, we'll be happy to you know, answer any additional questions one-on-one. -on -one. We will make this webinar available online. We'll send you guys a follow-up email with a link. And we look forward to hearing your questions and hopefully scheduling one-on-one -on -one, uh, demonstrations or meetings with you guys to answer any additional questions, see how we can support you with your research. All right. So with that, I thank uh, you again, Keith and uh, Stefan for taking the time and uh, for everybody in the audience for joining us today. Hopefully this was informative for you guys and we look forward uh, to seeing you again uh, next month. My pleasure. Thank you, Bye. Wally. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks to everyone.